but that fly, am I right? Anyway, welcome <laughs> to The Fundamentalist, everybody. My name is Ellie Morgan. I'm here with one of my favorite people in the whole world. His name is Peter Rollins, and this is a podcast where we talk about the possibility of life before death, as if to imply you can't have it beforehand without our help, which is true. Um, yeah. This is my week to choose a topic. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited. Well, I kind of know what you're going to say. But you do know what I'm going to say. for the sake of the podcast. Yes. And what? for those who are, have clicked on it, you, they probably know they've seen the title. Have they? Well, they will have by the oh, time. Oh, all right. Cool. Yeah. But, yeah. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you just clicked on it blindly and that's good for you. This is all about echo chambers, y'all, which is a um, very fun topic, uh, something that everyone knows. You know what it's like. You, you feel it in certain areas. Maybe you feel it in your own life. Maybe you see it. other people getting sucked into echo chambers, staying in echo chambers. What's up with them? What are they? What's the deal? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they an unavoidable? Um, are they a necessary part of our uh, approach to life because they make us feel safe and surrounded by people who are of like mind. Who knows? I certainly don't. But I think that since we're headed in in this election year toward a uh, certain doom, why don't we start unpacking some of these ideas, start thinking about them in slightly different ways and see if, uh, see if we can have a little fun along the way. Um, uh, but also, Pete, what are you? How are you? I mean, I'm good. I, I like this topic. I was actually going to ask where you've seen echo chambers in the recent year or two. That's Did, a great... Like what, what sparked off this My thought? brother wrote uh, a... Uh, my brother is... Is always in echo chambers. Never, echo listens, chamber. never listens to anyone who doesn't think like himself. Right, exactly. I've heard you say that a lot about he's him. He's incredibly... Yeah. Everything... Oh, Narcissistic. Oh, narcissistic. Yeah. It's all... He's all like, um, I got it figured out. And anyone who says otherwise is a, yeah. Is a jerk. Yeah. He's... um bad guy now he's a wonderful wonderful human um and also listens to this podcast so that's very very sweet but um he wrote a blog about um uh, which if i think to do it i'll put it in the the description but it was about social media in particular uh, and yeah. um you worried about the air don't worry but it's fine it's, it's fine isn't it i think it's, yeah yeah i think that's i little... could quietly like turn it on constantly while you're talking that's fine no yeah no you don't oh keep it on, oh, yeah, keep it on. great I thought you meant that you were just going to keep turning it on and turning it off while I was talking, <laughs> which I think I keep all this. Um, yeah, absolutely. He went from one end of the echo chamber back to the other. But yeah. yeah, my brother wrote a blog on social media and it was all about different, like um, one section was on how it can create echo chambers and how you can sort of get sucked into it. And the algorithms of social media tend to favor your uh, biases in a way that makes you keep clicking and gives you that dopamine rush, which can help create a, a uh, world where you don't get dissenting opinions of any kind um, and you can become further and further ingrained in whatever it is that you think about the uh, reality but that's where it comes from uh, yeah, that's where my idea was and I just feel like everyone I don't know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like everyone I think likes to think that they're not in some kind of an echo chamber and everyone you know that's like this thing where um People, you know that thing which I'm guilty of where you can brag about like, well, I follow a lot of different opinions. I, oh, follow, yeah. I watch a lot of different, you know, I always like to see this. I do that all the time. And, yeah. but I get to a point sometimes where I'm like, why? Who cares? I don't, yeah. I don't need, sometimes I'm like, do I need, like not everything, can everything be defined as an echo chamber just because most people around you are in agreement with it? Like if most people around me believe that the earth is round, Am I in like an echo chamber? Do I need to like invite the opinions in of flat, flat earthers, earthers yeah. to like really yeah. weigh the options? I don't think I do. Yeah, that, yeah, that I don't. Th yeah, very good. But you have yeah. some ideas here. You have some meteor stuff. Yes. than just me blabbing around. No, well, when you said about the topic, I was thinking about what is called in structural psychoanalysis the the imaginary register, which is basically right when you're a baby. Um, Funny, right, taking this example, right, you're a baby. Um, I'm a baby. Yeah. <laughs> you've got, you feel hunger inside your body, so you feel hungry. Hunger. You also hear a noise, some, some train is going past, and you Choo -choo. hear that noise. And also then something pricks you, you, you know, put you get a pin by mistake. Right? Now, the difficulty is, you don't know which is inside and which is outside. Yeah. Right? You, when you're a baby, it's, it all feels like it's kind of inside. You're goo. Right? Yeah, you're good. So, you know, you don't know what the, the, okay, the noise is outside, but the hunger pains are inside and, and the, the pin prick is outside. That's all it feels. And so you're just like hunger makes me feel pain, which makes trains run. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you combine all, it all. It's all mangled. Um, 
And even actually whenever kids get a little bit older, there's a thing called tra transitivism, where you'll see if one kid hurts themselves, another kid will cry. Right? It's not even they're empathizing with the kid's pain, but they, they can't differentiate between inside and outside. Mm -hmm. So one kid falls, the other kid cries. Right? And as we get older, we have empathy, but it's not the same. If you cut yourself, I'll laugh. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. cry or whatever. It's um, weird if it's the same. Yeah, yeah, that it would be too close. If you hurt yeah. yourself <laughs> and I started crying, I or was like, take me to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, this is, although for he's for, going pe through something. Yeah. for people who who suffer from psychotic symptoms, transitivism continues through their life, so they will feel like they're they're they, they will find it difficult to tell the difference between what's inside and outside. So that's a that's a difficult well, symptom for. You know, yeah. it's funny you bring that up. I uh, was trying to recall the differences in would you call it post would you call it post structural theory of psychotic neurotic perverse or like probably structural psychoanalytic okay that's not gonna that's not gonna stick that, <laughs> that's not gonna, <laughs> i've already forgotten what you just said <laughs> but uh i was trying to remember the perverse neurotic um psychotic yep. delineations and you've you have been very kind in explaining this to me <sighs> I don't know how many times. And um, for some reason, I just, I can't really remember beyond neurotic is always neurotic and worried about what everyone else thinks. And that takes up the majority of people. And then they're psychotic and perverse. And I completely forget what the other oh, ones yeah. are. So could you give a brief, most condensed, condensed yeah. thing? Okay. So you would say that the psychotic individual that we're talking, that I've mentioned there, is someone who. Uh, their, their, their ego boundaries have not necessarily solidified so sometimes they, they don't know where they start and stop mm -hmm. inside and outside is a problem you know all of that kind of thing so psychotic symptoms are often voices that you hear in your head you suffer from the tyranny of certainty you can't doubt things um, a neurotic is someone who is constantly in doubt questioning themselves and their motives and um, uh and then a perverse subject is one who... Dildos. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> you're talking yeah. about dildos. Yeah. Uh, that's what perverts are. They're, uh, they're all about dildos. <laughs> it's the most perverse thing I could think of. I like it. <laughs> Although the, the main thing about the perverse then is not dildos, is um, to some extent the, the perverse subject thinks that they can be everything for the other. They can be the full sexual satisfaction of the other there's no you know so hmm. that, that was a very poor way of describing the del delineation but you could say it like this the better way of saying it is um will, do we, will we get into this will i mean get into it? i think you gave a pretty good okay. indicator okay. i don't want to go too because yeah, i know not too deep just i know it's a whole world i yeah. get i get the perverse one i don't totally get it's the hard one because it's kind of almost in between psychotic yeah. and neurotic so the easy ones are psychotic and neurotic they're easy to tell the difference you can understand that perverse is just a slightly different structure but i think it's it definitely is its unique thing but it's harder to understand have you thought about maybe writing a letter and they can come up with some different names for these terms mm -hmm. this seems like a it seems like when the words get used so colloquially in different ways, it's very yeah. difficult to be able to speak freely about it because you have to be like, well, in the sense of the post-structural theory, or the, what was it? Oh, yes. Kind so of structural psychoanalysis, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> back to echo chambers. Uh, yeah. So what, oh, what is yeah. a psychotic? So, well, so the psychotic kind of, to be honest, sometimes has an experience similar to what you would see as a, a child have, which is um, uh, they... as don't know the difference between inside and outside that kind of can blur yeah. a little bit but basically for a child then they have an infant is all fragmented inside and outside is difficult all of that and then what's called the imaginary is where the child begins to get a sense of themselves as a subject as a self mm -hmm. and they do that through images through seeing others mm -hmm. and so in, in, a, in a really basic way, the imaginary stage is a stage in which you, it's called mirroring or mirror neurons. It's where you come to know yourself through looking at others and everyone is basically the same as yourself. They might be bigger or smaller or weaker or stronger, but it's called the small other, an other with a, with a small O. 
Uh, everyone is just another like you. And basically what happens is after about the age of three to five, what's readable stage, uh, what's called the symbolic happens. And the symbolic is when you start to repress things and then you start to get an unconscious and then you become a divided subject and you realize that you're colonized by desires that you don't fully know. So before the symbolic, um, I know this, right? I, I need to get... I think, I'm, I think I can help. I think I can help. Okay. You. So before the symbolic, there is just, you have a sense of yourself and others and there is no what's called big other there is no kind of dimension of yourself which is unknown and in the realm of the symbolic you don't tolerate difference that's ultimately what happens is you either everybody is kind of like taking drugs everybody there's no what's called alterity everybody is a semblance of yourself everybody is a it's reflection like psychedelics. of you. psychedelics will put you into a type of imaginary space which is all very nice prove it but what happens is um, you're always looking for the same. It's like an echo chamber. Everyone's a ref you want everybody to reflect yourself, yourself to reflect everybody. And if someone doesn't fit with that, then they're going to be horrific. You want to get rid of them. You want to push them away. Which is, would be, that makes sense as like a stage of development stage for of, yeah. wanting to feel like you could safely develop. Yeah. So I think a lot of what we see as echo chambers is, is echoes of the imaginary stage in our lives. It's when we feel fragmented, when we feel like, you know, that we're not at one with ourselves, when we feel that we're colonized by other desires and ambiguous feelings, we run to having a simple notion of ourselves as whole, as complete, as having a simple kind of like way of seeing the world. And that's what an echo chamber is. I love that. Did I get somewhere? My goodness. You did, but boy, <laughs> God almighty, if it wasn't a dang walk. Yeah. Uh, gosh. That is, I'm oh. glad we got water. Whew. Yeah. I was struggling with you because I, I was like, he's going to get some. He's got to get somewhere. He's got to get somewhere. I've got to land the plane somehow. <laughs> he'll land it. He's going to land, land somewhere. Land something, land with land. Or something with ego formation. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, that's yeah. a wonderful idea. Because the idea I had, because, you know, I don't. I'm not an expert in psychoanalysis or anything, but I know enough about Freud and I know enough to, to be like, to just assume everything is a dick or a vagina, no matter what it is. <laughs> yep. Um, and, uh, but I liked the idea with the echo chamber thing. Cause when I visualize an echo chamber, I visualize, um, a, like, you know, an echo chamber or like a dome shaped room that everyone is, uh, standing in yeah. screaming at each other and, and, and going like, yeah, and no outside opinions can get in and I was like, well, a dome, I was like, that's kind of like a pregnant, that's a pregnant belly. Like yeah. that's a womb and it's a, okay, that's safety and you're wanting to to, to feel um, okay about existence, which would make sense if you feel like you're a divided person. Yes, and that's exactly, like whenever you talk about an echo chamber, that's like this notion of the imaginary, which is like a hall of mirrors. Mm -hmm. So an echo chamber, you hear your own voice coming back to you. In a hall of mirrors, you see your own image coming yeah. back to you. And that in the imaginary is kind of, that's how we begin to get a sense of self. So I do think sometimes when, when in psychoanalysis, they talk about the big other, <clears throat> what they mean is they partly just mean that there is a part of yourself that you're not aware of, that you don't know that you put out into the world. So if you're talking to your, an analyst, you maybe say, oh, I know what you're thinking, but it's not what they're thinking, it's what you're thinking. You're putting it on to them, mm -hmm. right? Um, the big other is really this dimension of yourself that is not yourself, this dimension of yourself that you're not aware of. And I think for many of us, we're afraid of that dimension of ourselves. We're afraid of the fact that we're not at one with ourselves. And so we run to the imaginary, the, the echo chamber that, that kind of like is, is a way of avoiding the big other. It's a way of avoiding alterity. It's a way of avoiding our own strangeness to ourselves. Yep. We like to think that we're transparent to ourselves. We know what we believe. We know what we think. And we do that through hey, hanging out with people I like just ourselves. say it like it is, and this is what it is, and I'm just like, you can take it or leave it, but you can trust what I say is who I am because I'm just a straight shooter, and it is what, ah! And then you just freak, the person <laughs> yeah. freaks out. And That's then they it. start getting, and I just, every now and then on the, you know, weekend, I, uh, you know, 
peel cucumbers and put them up my butt. So it's, uh, but besides that, I'm a straight, normal person and there's nothing to worry about. Yes. Uh, that's a great example, actually, because that's what cucumbers. the unconscious is. It's a, it's a distortion. It's a cucumber up your butt. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> it's putting cucumbers up your butt. It's a distortion in your life, like this yeah. weird distortion, like everything's normal, but something in your life just kind of weirdly distorts the, yeah. the image you have of yourself. Well, especially because you're like, I, I think I tend to get a long quote unquote with most people, but man, when you see someone who's annoying and they really get to you, but you're aware on the other hand that other people are more annoying and they don't get to you. That's the fun part. Uh, It's like, Oh, there is something going on where something in me hates this person. (laughs) And I don't like to talk about what do you think was going on with all these? uh, I'm going to throw out a fun word I learned recently. Okay. Oh, dementia precox. Is that what oh, it's called? Yeah. Oh, uh, dementia precox. Yeah, that's basically that's an old, that's a really old fashioned term. Like, yeah, that's from very old. Really use that oh yeah, anymore, no, so it's, that's it's great. not using no, it. No, although it's, it's just in the fact I've only heard it as in something from a long time ago. <laughs> it comes back from the recesses of my unconscious. Yes, and, uh, it's a <laughs> voice that I can hear. It's schizoph- It's like yeah, the old. Yeah, that's what they. Yeah, that's schizophrenia. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I couldn't quite make the connection. Like, what is that? What, what do, do you, they call it now? Because this is. Yeah. I I do think this is the echo chamber thing is related to or could be seen as like. If you take the, the, what, the what we're talking about of like we're made up of different kind of little personalities that might flare up every now and then that you are uh, unknowing or you don't know and you're confused by, it would make sense that an echo chamber would kind of insulate you from that. But I, in talking about this sort of schizophrenia, like what do you think was going on with those people back then? Do you oh, remember yeah. like the people, all the like, those images of the woman fainting, you know, the hysterical woman. And then it's like all the men gathered around her, like being doctors and she's yeah. like losing her mind. And then like, I was reading on this, this stuff on these people. And it's like, it's so extreme. Like this yeah. gets so extreme and like personalities unaware of the other personality, just so creepy. Yeah. And no wonder that's like, Everyone thought it was demon possession because it seems like that. And then it is fun to go, well, if you just dial that back a little bit, if you just take the extreme, if you see it as a spectrum and not as just this condition that you have, if you just go further and further back on the spectrum, you're going to reach like who everyone is, like oh, yeah, that yeah. weird, mild form of of schizophrenia but you don't see that anymore these days i guess you do but they're literally in mental hospitals you do yeah i mean it's funny because you're talking as well about schizophrenia and then the extreme hysterias Hysteria, because, yeah. which you don't you don't see as much of and it's but funny do, but in freud's they, time it was huge it was so yeah, yeah. it's all they were talking it was about a very repressed society <laughs> victorian so, yeah. uh yeah the isn't that what it was they're all very yeah. chaste or whatever the word yeah and so that and so like freud's entire beginnings were because of there were these people who were so repressed and they had the weirdest symptoms like uh where the limbs would completely stop functioning and people would go blind wouldn't see somebody in a room i mean you get all of this today but it seemed like there was a lot of it going so on. much yeah, <laughs> yeah. crazy <laughs> now we just put everything on different social media platforms yeah. that's our way of having different voices it's like i'm having fun on vacation here's my instagram i'm angry about politics Here's my tweet, and I just funnel yeah. all my schizophrenics into different. I mean, it probably helps that people can express themselves more, which they do too too much sometimes. But it's probably healthier to shout at somebody on Twitter than the idea, like the the initial the initial insight of psychoanalysis with the first patient Anna O, was um, that if you don't talk about shit, that stuff's going to find a way to explode. Yeah. Um, and so even just working, just being able to speak about your angers and frustrations can be curative. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Um, is there like, so when it comes to the idea of an echo chamber, yeah. to use it as loosely as possible, do you feel like in order to learn everything there is about a worldview or whatever the echo chamber is, mm-hmm. Do you think it's good to enter into that with people to true? Well, I guess you can't, excuse me, you can't truly enter into it if you're not believing it, I guess. But like, you know what I mean? Like going to where, going to the source of what everyone is shouting when they're all shouting the same things at each other to try to get a feel for what these people are actually standing for. Do you think there's value in that? Or do you think it's like, 
best to avoid any anything like that and do your own thing and keep your head on the on the ground. So feet on the ground, I guess. I'm sure, you sound like say it again. I think like, is there value in being like I'm going to submerge myself in a echo chamber, quote unquote right. echo chamber, in order to like get a feel, really understand? It's like when I watch Fox News oh, or, yeah. or or MSNBC. Uh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to understand with these people. I'm going to listen to this podcast and and, and really get kind of what they're saying. One, is it effective? You know, does it work? Can you ever really get a feel for it if you're not like? lock stock and barrel into something and then two is it even who cares do you yeah. need to do it who cares no i mean it is fascinating if you've got an interest it's fascinating to listen to an echo chamber just to see what it tells you about that group and that society so there's a number of echo chambers and just looking at them will tell you a lot about almost like, like a yeah. analyst yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But mm-hmm. the, the, the big thing for me is if this is right so in, in a terrible way i was trying to explain the movement from the imaginary to the symbolic but this is where it makes sense is if it's true that we start off kind of by getting a sense of ourselves through interacting with others and we then move into the symbolic where we start to repress things and then we create the big other or the unconscious then and then we are afraid of that side of ourselves if that's all true that means that people enter into echo chambers not because they're scared of the otherness of the other they're scared of the otherness of themselves oh here we go right <laughs> so yeah it means that that the most terrifying thing is when i encounter somebody who has different beliefs it's not that they have different beliefs. That's not the threat. The threat is if I see myself through their eyes, I will see that my beliefs are weird and I'll see that I'm not at one with myself. So what I do is I surround myself with an echo chamber, not because I'm terrified of what someone else thinks, but I'm actually terrified of encountering my own ambivalence, my own mixed feelings and beliefs, the, the repressed parts of myself. Um, and if that's the case, then we're misunderstanding when we think that, oh, in a debate, um, right? Well, basically, you've got to de- the standard notion of a debate is I'm trying to convince you and you're trying to convince me. But a better type of debate is I'm listening to you because you're going to help me see elements of myself that I can't see. By talking to you, I'm going to see weaknesses in my own position and I'm going to see ambivalences in my own community and vice versa if you listen to me. because. Say I'm a Democrat, I think Democrats are great. I can't understand why you'd be a Republican. But then if I listen to you and I see myself through your eyes, I see things in the Democratic Party that I haven't noticed. And I'm like, oh yeah, maybe we are a bit like that sometimes. So mm-hmm. that, that for me is the ultimate threat that echo chambers are designed to protect us from. It's, to, it's designed to protect us from the otherness that we are to ourselves. <laughs> the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you're inside the echo chamber to protect yourself, not from the outside opinion, but from the opinion that's already in the echo chamber. Yeah. It just hasn't made itself known yet. Yeah. Ooh, fun. Yeah. That's why it's so obvious to people outside an echo chamber that people engage in the return of the repressed. So yeah. you'll see groups that say one thing, but you see the explosion of the opposite. They talk about oh, yeah. love, and yet there's a profound hatred of the other. Or they talk about humility, and yet there's a profound certainty. or Whatever it is, and the group's completely blind to it. They don't see it. But if you're outside the community, you can kind of see the hypocrisy. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah. The great philosopher Ben Folds, who said, uh, uh, see that asshole with a peace sign on his license plate giving me the finger and running me out of his lane. Oh, nice. That's yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's good. That's a good example. Of Love it. Ben. Yeah. Love him. I see it. In tw- I've got friends on Twitter, and they'll, like, they'll literally go at it, like, so vitriolically attack others. And then there'll be a tweet about how we all have to love each other. And what's hilarious is literally it can be the next tweet. The Pete, f- it's because your friends are insane. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've met many Present of them. Company I am among yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think I, I've seen, yeah, I've, the, peop- the people I think I maybe know that you're referencing or would agree with, yeah, it's, a, it's remarkable. But I also am like, I get weirdly jealous of it. I get, mm. I get like, I'm impressed by people who just let it all hang out on social media and they're like, ah, I like this. And I'm there. Yeah. And now it's, it's uh, my uh, brother sent a video of my nephew 
laughing and giggling and then kind of go like his he um, was doing a funny voice with my nephew and, he, and he's just making all these really cute faces smiling and then he's surprised and he's curious and he's like going through the whole motions and um, which you know, by the way is the imaginary that's the exact image of mimetic desire and mirror neurons is you're doing you're the child mimics dude, what you do yeah I was watching there was on um, I think it was like the front page of reddit or so, some video where they were showing an experiment of um a woman in front of a baby and she did, yeah and she does the smiling you told me about this and then oh, doesn't it, doesn't smile yeah and doesn't. she's just and then she turns around and she just stops and she starts blanking at the ba- or staring at the bl- baby blankly and it it takes like a minute and then the baby's just like <laughs> and then the baby just starts losing Freaks it out. and all yeah. it took was they're just staring it's crazy yeah. um but it was like that yeah it was like yeah. seeing that in real time and it was really cool but i was like the the faces uh that he's making that's what I look like when I go through Twitter, when I read Twitter. Like, I'll be like, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh. and uh, it's because it's so many, just, it's so much shouting and so many voices. And sometimes it'll be the same person's Twitter feed, the same person going, ha, hu, ha, here's a joke. Here's this. Here's something you should feel bad about. And it's like, I just, I don't know. I feel like it's, uh, it's cool that people can do that. It's also yeah. very exhausting for all of us to read. And I've had to, you know, yeah. this is not the topic we're talking about. This is really probably even talking about echo chambers is my way of trying to be like, so I sh- we should delete all of our social media accounts, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you're, you're hitting on exactly the, the issue with, um, you see the dividedness of somebody on their social media. You see that they're at war with themselves. You see that there's unconscious explosions. But of course, that person themselves isn't aware of it. Yeah. Right. That's the point. Is that they? Um, so that's the threat. That that's basically what I think. And the, my worry is that there is a failure of the symbolic in our society. In Western society, there's a failure of the symbolic, uh, which and the failure of the symbolic means that you know you're not going to believe this, Pete. I agree. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. I think it might be the biggest problem of our time. But go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, I actually think. We might be headed towards yeah. certain doom as a result of losing <laughs> yeah. a symbolic. Okay. Because, because, yeah, if there's a failure of the symbolic at a, at a social level, then that means that we tend towards the imaginary, which is a battle of all against all. It's a, we want to surround ourselves with the same. We want to abolish the other, get rid of the other. We can't tolerate the otherness of ourselves. We can't tolerate ambiguity. And without being able to tolerate ambiguity, you can't really have dialogue and discourse. Mm-hmm. You basically ends up in war. You know, that's mm-hmm. the thing. So want to avoid that. Somebody's got to tell somebody about this. Yeah, yeah. we got to spread something. the news. <laughs> um, this is, by the way, this is my critique of drugs, and you know I'm actually okay about recreational drugs. But, but psychedelic enlightenment, I do think that when people take ecstasy or something, they are... Um, they're going into the imaginary, so you experience the other as not really other. They're like a part of yourself. Yes. There, so all alterity is drained out of existence, with the exception of if someone comes in who's completely um, outside of that experience, and then you might see the, like a bad trip. Then you've got this opposite. That's why kids move from being happy to being absolutely the disintegration of themselves. There's like a this, this is called the, the real and the imaginary. It's like some, everything's great and then something comes in that you can't integrate and so it has to be utterly expelled. Yeah, and, um, and then repressed. Yeah. Well, yeah, repression is kind of the good thing. This is actually weirdly the kid's not repressing. They're, they're not able to take. So it's almost like a kid thinks there's a monster under the bed because they haven't been able to yet realize the monster's in them. They haven't been able to... So they expel it out yeah. into the world. And that's what the psychotic individual often struggles with, is that they, they, the stuff that's going on inside them feels like it's external. Mm-hmm. That's why they hear voices. It's like something is in them, but not in them. And that's, yeah, terrifying. Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference between the ghosts and goblins that are uh, projections from my psyche and the ones that are absolutely 100% real. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, One of them, some of them are real, though. Mm-hmm. I got an app that'll show me exactly where ghosts are in this room right now. Is that right? No, I don't have it on me. I deleted oh, it. It scared wow. me too much. It was too much power for one person. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, so how does it work? Like, is it like Pokemon? Do you, like, yes. You put it around. It's and then augmented you reality, yeah, where oh. you, you, you take it, and then you, it'll, 
show you wherever the spirit is uh, and it'll give you like a little bio it'll tell you if it's like a good spirit or a bad oh, spirit I have to do that yeah yeah you should do it but i wouldn't do it alone or at night it, it actually i'm so easily spooked by that stuff that i i avoid it but it's halloween you know yeah. why not oh yeah um yeah. and i think it costs like five bucks so all right I can do that. So if, the, if there could be a bigger waste of money, I don't know. <laughs> uh, scratch off tickets would probably be less of a waste of money. So, okay. Well, what do, what's your opinion on how you stay away from echo chambers? Say someone uh, hears this, I listen or take away from it, you know, that um, echo chambers serve a function. They serve a very valuable function for a certain time. But yeah. the imaginary phase is not something you want to be stuck in in any particular way. You want to yeah. be able to hold on to a symbolic um approach but you also want to grow into being an adult with your own opinions and your own formed thoughts that are not only a amalgamation of everything that's been dumped into you for the first years of your life how do you get out how do you escape yeah. how do you get out of the, whatever cult we're all in yeah well you know i think for like most of us it's the key to realizing that we're in echo chambers sometimes because we're afraid of our own unconscious we're afraid of the other that's within ourselves. So as soon as you start, so for example, if someone like believes very strongly that the other side is evil, right? Bad, wrong, whatever. Um, that's fine and easy to maintain, but it's a bit more scary when you go, maybe I'm projecting out onto that other side, something that's within me, something of my childhood, something of my past, something, and that the echo chamber isn't protecting me from the external other it's protecting me from the internal other the the alien from inner space not the alien from outer space sure. the alien from inner space i think if if people are have a community and a space where they can genuinely open themselves up to that thought and unpick it then you'll find yourself less drawn to echo chambers needing them less more open to the other more open to ref, to argumentation etc cetera, etc cetera. so for me it's not it's not like and uh, it's not simply kind of like I'm going to throw myself into hearing other people or I oh maybe I'm scared of the other maybe I should be less scared of the other it's more it's deeper than that it's no, you're scared of something inside yourself because there's stuff in there isn't that the weirdest thing yeah there's just stuff yeah we're at all all this stuff rolling around in our brains that we're unaware of that is driving the car and it is so silly i know and only the truth hurts so there's a french saying about this where if so if i if i um attack you if i say something yeah. nasty to you i get it but it, yeah you're right it, whatever it is you're right what's up what, i just go you're right <laughs> okay, yeah well because if it does if it washes off your back then there's nothing inside you that's connected with it but if I say something to you, I have a friend who you have this experience where someone kind of like accused him of um, not being, a, you know, a, a good family member. And it really hurt him because deep down, he has that sense of shame. It's not true, but it's true for his psychic self. Like there's something. So whenever someone attacks you and what they say really digs at you it's likely that that's because it's touching with some element of repressed element of yourself that believes that that repressed element of yourself that kind of like um kind of connects with that insult uh, because i say if you get insulted if someone insults me and says you're going to go to hell right it doesn't mean anything to me because i don't have a worldview where that is significant but if someone says to me you're a racist or something like that that could have a deep impact or your your whatever like there's words that or for the opposite it could for mm -hmm. someone who's religious if you say to someone i think you're going to go to hell that really hits because it connects with some part of themselves <laughs> that's so, my go-to yeah. for everyone i think hey you think you're going to go to hell i think you're going to go to hell <laughs> yeah so i i go like whatever it is that really you hate when you hear if someone slags you off again it's like oh maybe i should analyze whether there's a repressed part of myself that connects with that so that I'm nice. trying to hide from. Ugh, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine or, yeah, the way I am. Just push it all down. Yeah, just push it all down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you for this. We're good on this talk about echo chambers. I'm pretty solid in my opinion on echo chambers, and I don't need you to cut, giving me all your little smart gobbledygook. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the thing that I get most offended by. Yeah, what, what gets to you? There's uh, like, I just oh, think so, what? so many things. All right. <laughs> no, it's, it's usually something like, uh, 
you think you're so smart. You think you're so, um, that usually does that because makes me, or you're an a- uh, asshole. If I, if I get like, you're an asshole, yeah. like you're an actual asshole. And you get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd think I do. Uh, Cause I'm always like, I guess people just, I just assume everyone thinks I'm an asshole. But then when, if I do ever hear it or read something like that, then, you know, Oh, uh, failure, people attacking uh-huh. failure or like, merits which at this point it's not so much but in the past people would come at me for failure or hoping for my failure which is a thing that has happened which is kind of kind of funny but um it is funny there's people out there that are like this guy gotta go down um but uh stuff like that i think yeah and I, i can pretty quickly i think be like yeah that probably is true like there's a little there's always that thing i mean that's like of course i wish i was more successful of course i would i want to be perceived as a likable person yeah. um and i can be an asshole so yeah whereas um, other things that people will say will just mean make no impact on you or me or someone else you wouldn't that, believe the that's amount. the funny thing yeah the, funny, <laughs> the amount of things that don't rile me i mean there's the word trigger which is uh, useful in the sense of like 99 things won't trigger you, but there'll be something that if that person just says that one thing, it just bugs the head out yeah. of you. And that's usually a, a sign that, as I say, not that there's just some element of you that's that, that resonates with that, like there's some unconscious bit of yourself. Yeah. Um, so that that's what I think the imaginary, that's why people flee to the imaginary. It's, it's a fleeing from the unconscious. Like mm-hmm. that, just that, that we're not masters of our own home. That, that, um, it's funny too. Cause yeah, even the creation or the, the inclusion of an echo chamber is like, if you create an echo chamber for yourself, if I may just go off the rails here and you can correct me uh, wherever I'm wrong here, it's like, you are kind of coping with your repression by some form of, um, maybe intellectualization, I guess, which is the yeah. term where you make it, where you talk about how you convince yourself using words and logic that you're right about everything. I mean, all of it is a, a, truly a defense mechanism, but you're metaphorically, I know we're talking about a metaphorical echo chamber, but an echo chamber is around you. So metaphorically, it's external. So you're externalizing the the conflict yeah. within yourself and keeping the people or the pr- parts of your personality that you really like close by. Uh, so that you can feel like you are only that those aspects and not the you know cucumber guy. That's it. I mean, it's called the ego ideals. One way of describing it, where you want to have your sense of yourself, your ego that's kind of solid, it's together, it's there. Um, it's kind of like your Facebook profile. It's your it's uh, the yeah, way the you, avatar. Yeah, yeah, your avatar, which you kind of like you know manage and manicure in a certain way. Um, but we all do it. We all. This is my Facebook profile and yours. Mm-hmm. Like we manicure ourselves in a certain way to protect us from. Which, by the way, which is great. You couldn't live always kind of confronting the kind of the otherness of yourself. That like you couldn't live. That would be too much. Too exhausting. Yeah, yeah, too exhausting. But you do need a space in your life where you can, you can do that. Yeah. You need like little spaces in your life where you're able to kind of like. Uh, delve into that space seems very you can get real inflated if you uh make it all about like i'm going to find because it almost implies that if you're like all right i like certain echo chambers i i like to hang out in this forum because uh it reinforces you know who i think i am or who i want to be or who i want to portray myself as um i forgot where i was going with this Mm. i started thinking about the. i was like in my head i was like don't forget where you're going with this what were you just saying uh, not even, not oh, even. the ego ideal, the kind of manicured version of yourself. Is that what I was saying? Yeah. The, I don't know. It's, it's, isn't that funny how drop things drop out too? Because I was really, I had a point. Yeah. And I'm not even like on anything. Wow. Well, maybe, that, maybe that's the issue. Uh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your body's not used to it. I almost <laughs> found it what again. What does it feel like? <laughs> yeah. What is this? <laughs> Why am I aware of it? I was like, oh, I'm painfully aware of what I'm saying right now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't remember what it was. But it was, I also feel like I threw this off because, right, we're talking about echo chambers, which means we're talking about how we like to surround ourselves with the same, with people who think like us, uh, kind of like... Mm-hmm. Said two dudes views. in an apartment talk, who talk about the same thing yeah, all the time. exactly. There you go. Yeah. So we're at, this is our echo chamber, or the imaginary. Um, so, oh yeah, so I connected that with the imaginary. We're like, was that a long shot? But no, I think it works. I think it works because... Um, 
uh, but then uh, then the idea of the symbolic. Yeah, I think that that if we if we think like this, then we can say that one of the major dangers that we're facing today is that we are unable to tolerate a certain ambivalence and certain fracturedness within ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's to do with a failure of the symbolic. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We should do, we're going to have to do way more conversations on this whole symbolic thing. Yeah. Because I tell you, a whole bunch of real meaty stuff uh, in that word and in the phase, I guess, of life or whatever. And it's very, it's all very beautiful and wonderful. I think that if you uh, end up going into some sort of a echo chamber or whatever, there is this, um, I think this is kind of what I was getting at saying. There's an almost, you can become almost obsessive about making sure that you aren't in echo chambers, that you are like oh, yeah. uh, equally receiving of information. But it is kind of the fun, from what I can tell, it seems like another fun part of the trick of psychoanalysis to make it so that you can hold these things lighter because you can realize that it's not actually about your opinion on like trickle down economics. It might actually be about something else or holding on to something. And it might be the act of holding it more tighter than it is the thing yeah. that you're holding itself. And, um, and so I, I think there's almost a sense of su superiority that you can slip into with a lot of these things where it's like, well, you know, uh, I, I watch a lot of like different sort. It's like yeah. you're proving, so you're still proving something. You're still presenting an image of being um, well-informed rather than presenting an image of having one solid opinion that is surrounded by an echo chamber. Yeah. Like an example that you brought up at the beginning is very good. You talked about the flat earth, right? Now, the problem is not that people don't surround themselves with different stuff. As you say, that can be its own defense mechanism. The issue is why do you not surround yourself with certain people? So I don't surround myself with flat earthers because I'm completely indifferent to it. Like if I met someone who was a flat earther, it would make it would have no libidinal investment. Oh. I would I would I'd find it interesting. Actually, I would sit down. Yeah. Go, but it, but it would have no impact. I would be like yeah. a kid in cr at Christmas. Yeah. I would yeah. lose my mind. But you wouldn't you wouldn't be offended that they would call you a gloober. You'd go, oh, you're a gloober or whatever. You'd be I'd like, eat it yeah, up. Yeah. You'd eat it up. But I'd have it for every yeah. meal for the next week. Yeah. I'd put it as leftovers. It'd be beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so, but no negative impact. And even even flat. I should even do something even more I, mundane. Yeah. But let's do flat earth. Is that so it has no attachment. Vaxxer, anti-vaxxer. Anti-vaxxer, although yeah, well anti-vax, yeah, that's similar, it probably doesn't, I mean, you might be against it, but you're not like. Q. What's that? I can go down the list, Q. Q, oh yeah, Q you know them all, you're, you're, you're members of all of these. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I can show you the Facebook uh, pages. Uh, but the difference is, if I don't hang out with someone, say I'm, a, I'm uh, you know, don't hang out with Republicans, that's a different not hanging out. Right? There's a not hanging out with flat earthers and there's a not hanging out with Republicans. And if one is, it's like the difference between not talking to your partner and not talking to your partner, right? Yeah, you know what? Go ahead. Okay, oh, just just to finish that, or oh, jump in. No, go oh, no, for finish. it. There's the not talking to your partner is like, oh, we've got nothing to say right now. We're just not talking. It doesn't mean anything. But that like silence that you kind of go, shit, there's stuff where we, we need to talk about. Yeah. There are two different negations, two different absences. So then not talking to a flat earther doesn't have anything worth analyzing, but not talking to a Republican, that is worth analyzing because there's libidinal investment. There's a, there's something aggressive in it. And, and that is probably more connected to something in me than it is in the other. Yeah, we're getting a little full circle here, much like perhaps echo chambers are shaped in, I will only imagine. <laughs> but um, yeah, the uh, there was this tweet from the Tweet of God, uh, Mm -hmm. account which i enjoy and it was god tweeting and it said um the bible uh jesus said to love your enemies but also jesus said a bunch of crazy shit <laughs> 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 it was very funny and i was like that's, that's solid that's good uh and i thought about that because it is such a it's a christian doctrine it's a very i think good doctrine to love your enemies and that kind of thing and i i don't know if it's a result of just being raised christian or if it is a desire to sort of be the best have the best outlook but when i see people who are like and i don't even want to i'm not saying this is a bad thing or that i'm not i'm trying to necessarily judge it because i truly am like go with god do your thing but when i see people that are like like if you are this party if you are this type of person i do not want you to read my 
book. I don't want you to watch my television show. I don't want you to buy my product. I don't want to see you. I don't want to, there is this, that casting out that happens that like this, um, throwing out, which certain, you know, things that are in those blanks, I get like, I, you know, certain thing, whatever, get them out, do your thing. But it does suck. It does seem like a lot of people right now are being, are, um, creating their own echo chambers, like, or at least trying to creating their own, uh, circle banishing the the yeah. thing that they they really and I'm like I get it on one hand because I kind of feel sometimes when I read it depending on the mood and depending on whatever I'll be like yeah like yeah you're telling them like you're telling them because this, sometimes people are rude online and you have a right if it's your yeah. account you have a right to not want pe- certain people to follow you or certain people to engage with your stuff I got no problem with that whatever do your thing but something in me per- for me personally is just like I don't know man it seems like a bummer it seems like a Maybe I don't take it seriously enough, but I would, I just wish I, you know, life is so colorful that it would yeah. suck to just be like, don't this person. I don't want to, does that make sense? Yeah. No, totally. I'm I mean, barely finishing yeah. a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is the problem with, in philosophy it's called, they call it alterity, but it's like, it's the inability to tolerate alterity and alterity means true otherness, something that is completely other. And here's the funny thing, right? Like you're talking if you come to Northern Ireland, you would find this I'm going to come to Northern Ireland. You have to come to Northern Ireland, right? But during the Troubles, you would have found it very bizarre that, that Protestants and Catholics were at each other's throats sometimes. And you would have found it very weird that um, loyalists and you, uh, nationalists were in this conflict. You would have been, you know, you would have gone, this is bad, this isn't good. But you wouldn't have felt any aggression. Like, you wouldn't have felt, it wouldn't bring anything up in you. Because it's not in you Mm -hmm. because you're not from Northern Ireland Um, in the same way when I in America and I see all of the things that are flaring up here I have a intellectual assessment of it but it doesn't get me because Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in 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 America so yeah so when I see people online I think of a few people on like Instagram and stuff you're doing that type of thing of like if you are this I don't want to be part of you often it doesn't take much to rate to find out that there maybe grew up in an environment where those beliefs w- were there and that what they're doing is they're actually you know trying to expel something that's within themselves mm. and the point of this is not so that we all kumbaya get along not at all the point is you can't get to disagreement until you've done the hard work of encountering those ambiguities in yourself once you do that you can actually get into heartfelt disagreement and i've talked about this before but the difference between war and conflict war is the inability to have conflict when you want to destroy the other it's because you cannot tolerate a conflictual back and forth with them so war is funnily enough the absolute it's it's in the imaginary war is in the imaginary it's the ultimate rejection of conflict whereas conflict is when you literally go I disagree with you profoundly and I'm going to fight with you and we're going to meet every week and we're going to fight it out. But that fighting might produce something novel. I might produce something that neither of us could imagine. That's that's alchemy. You're an alchemist. Okay. Pete loves alchemy and he believes in alchemy and he, uh, (laughs) I'm an apocalypticist because yeah, it's a, the thing about progressivism is you kind of know where it's going to go. An apocalypticist says, I don't know where it's going to go. And this is what happened in Northern really? Ireland. Really? Yeah. I feel like it's the opposite. No, so if you're a progressive... The, apocalyp- is it, the apocalypse is just, is just like, I know where it's going. It's going down. Well, yes, the, yeah, a world is going to end and a new world is coming. But the apocalypticist is kind of just knows the world's ending. So if politically, huh. if you're an apocalypticist, you're like, all I know is if we engage in ongoing conflict and discussion this old world of conflict will die and a new world will arise. We don't know what it is. Mm. Whereas a progressive knows where the world's going. So if, if I'm a progressive, I, I like you and I can love you, but in a patronizing way, because ultimately I know where, where the future's going. We're all traveling toward a utopia that will... Yeah, yeah. and it's all painted in a particular way. But in Northern it's Ireland, all it's, it's painted in a very particular way. You know right. what that utopia is. In Northern painted Ireland, in a particular way. That's a phrase that just got... That you're... Irish accent swallowed. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it got painted. I was like, I don't know. No, 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 no getting excited. Yeah, I'm you talking get... fast. <laughs> I like your Irish accent. That's very good. Thanks. I'm working That's, on it. Yeah. Um, in Northern Ireland, we got to a point where nobody knew what the future could be because we all disagreed. But we went, we all have to sit in the room together. 
Catholics, Protestants, Unionists, Nationalists, and all come yeah. together. And they created what was called the Good Friday Agreement because it was agreed on Good Friday. And Good Friday, interestingly, is the is where God dies. So it's the Good Friday symbolically is where the infinite and the finite collapse, right? So that it's an a- absolute contradiction. God isn't supposed to die. Deicide. aside. So, yeah, exactly. So it's which is an ultimate contradiction. And the Good Friday Agreement was a contradiction. It was the result of two alterities, two incommensurable worlds clashing together, creating a way forward, which which involved disbanding the police force and its current model, recreating it from scratch, all of this. It was quite an incredible thing, but it was an apocalyptic moment because we all had to go, the politicians had to go into the room going, we have to let go of where we think this is gonna go and we just have to be committed to the conflict. There's some kind of lesson to take from that, but I'm not interested in <laughs> yep. diving into it. Do you think uh, maybe they had that uh, agreement ready to go on Thursday, but they were like, let's wait a day. Wait, yeah, let's <laughs> get, get, get. There was a war going on and people are dying. Like, yeah, but if we wait till tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was such a cool name. I mean, that's synchronicity, right? Cause, yeah. And I think they, they did it right up to midnight. It was like midnight on Good Friday. And it was like this, I can't remember how many hours, but it was over like three days perhaps. And it was like, and it and everyone's going like is this gonna mm-hmm. get anywhere and then it, something arose that created a new world and a new possibility and northern ireland's probably the most successful peace process in the history of the modern world wow yeah you know more successful than what you say you see in south africa even and the truth and reconciliation mm-hmm. stuff so that is what but yeah that's what i think Love it. it needs to happen i like that a lot man yeah i liked how you you kept you had a second, you're like, I got another point to make, and then you stop. Do you have something? No. Nope. It looked like it was about to burst burst forth out of you. <laughs> um, I like this conversation. Do you have any other thoughts on it? No, yeah, no, I've enjoyed I, th- I felt like you know, I was struggling for a bit, so hopefully people got past the struggle. Dude, and I loved it. Somewhere. That was my favorite part of the whole thing. It's yeah. been downhill since then, because I was like, <laughs> I shouldn't have asked about the psychotic, neurotic. I, every time I do, I just end up more, uh, not more confused, but. About the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's the, here's the way to think about it. Like, this is what Bruce Fink says, who's a, an author I really like. He was my psychoanalyst for a while, actually. Um, the psychotic individual is one who has had trouble separating from the primary caregiver. So psychotic symptoms are kind of where you don't know where you begin and where you end, your senses. So that's schizophrenia, bipolar, melancholia, pa- uh, paranoia. So paranoia is you think, you know, someone's watching you, someone's mm-hmm. surveilling you, you've seen this. Lower you've form seen, of, a, yeah, another lower form of schizophrenia, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're kind of all in the same wheelhouse. Then the perverse subject, right, they are separated from the primary caregiver. This is called the no of the father has happened. So a separation has happened. So that for the psychotic individual... In their life or they are in this state constantly or both? Like you mean in their upbringing, they were physically separated? No, psychologically separated. So there's okay. some psychological... So so the great thing about psychoanalysis is we're all abnormal, right? Mm-hmm. There's no normal, right? We're all abnormal in different ways. And each of these three are different ways to deal with loss, to deal with lack, to deal with the you know some sort of desire, right? So the psychotic individual will will generally just live their life, no problems. But if they have symptoms, they will be symptoms of tyrannized by certainty, paranoia, maybe feeling they're being watched all the time, Mm -hmm. maybe not knowing where they start and finish. Then the perverse subject is one who has had a separation psychologically. Although you are right, I mean, it can happen physically, right? But psychologically, they've had an initial separation, but it hasn't being complete and this is called the name of the father right so the perverse subject thinks that they can have oceanic oneness they can return to the one they can fill the lack of the other i'm still the other. <laughs> you're doing a great job for some reason i'm back to being confused <laughs> and i <laughs> i'm like i just i think a, just bored. i think you're being polite and you're just getting back to being bored this is this <laughs> dude i truly almost yawned i was like don't yawn you asshole like that is what this is the problem but uh, i do i do love those differentiations but um yeah. i uh, i feel like you landed the plane and then i just put the propellers back up and off off you want i do i do yeah. well I mean, it's its own episode but oh I, yeah but you know the funny thing is right the way i'm describing it not all psychoanalysts would go with this 
completely because the way I'm describing it is you're generally one or other. <clears throat> but then some psychoanalysts, my friend Chris, basically says we all have psychotic cores and we can all be neurotic yeah. and all of that. But the perverse subject is in the middle. And then I'll say just one thing about the neurotic. Uh, the neurotic is someone who is separated from the other and they feel a certain disappointment and they feel a certain lack and they feel a certain kind of like a, um, you know kind of sadness about that yeah so those are the three the three buckets a little insecurity a little insecurity so neurotic individuals which is the majority of people they their symptoms are often um kind of feeling like uh um, they're full of doubts they they feel dissatisfied with their work or their love life and they or you know the difference is there's a there's the obsessive who is just uh tries to fill the lack by having everything complete in their lives and all of that. I don't know if that... I was hoping you just kept going and going and going again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's happening again. It's gotta, gotta, you gotta pay attention this time. Uh, yeah, it's all very wonderful. I mean, but you, you, you are saying that from within the echo chamber of the psychoanalytic terminology. Oh, yeah. From the echo chamber. Oh, yeah, where does that fit? I'm just trying to make it full oh, circle. Yeah. I have nothing important to add with that. Um, all right. Well, yeah. I very much enjoyed this episode, yeah. folks. So how about that? Um, if you have any thoughts on this or on echo chambers or what your experience has been with them, please let us know in the comments. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review over at iTunes. It helps a lot. You can also listen to this on Spotify and here on the, uh, the Valley Cast channel. Please feel free to subscribe and like this video as well. It's very nice of you. We want to hear from you. We like reading it. Um, That's true. You're very sweet. Plus, it, it, uh, if you I got a really nice email from someone who listens to The Fundamentalist and really wow. liked it. So w w when that's lovely to hear yes. feedback. We, uh, we hear a lot, and it's, we listen, and thank you, and you guys are very I'm just sweet. not sure if anyone's going to give good feedback for this particular one. No, I <laughs> like it, man. It's good. It's good. I mean, it's, it's I, you know, you asked me to, you made the mistake when, I, when you were like, you'll just carry it, right? And I was like, yeah, I'll carry it. And I should have just, I didn't really carry it. And, you know, and then that's the end of the episode. Just trail off. <laughs> just bye, trail everybody. Off. Bye, bye.